Could we turn this computer into this one with the help of just one cartridge? It looks like we can, for the most part. And if you stick around to the end, we'll even make a modern version of that cartridge. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. A few months ago, I restored this unique cartridge that supposedly converts an SVI-328 into a full MSX computer. Today, we're going to see what exactly it does and whether we can make a modern replica to do the same thing. I covered this cartridge in a previous video. I highly recommend you check it out for the restoration process and some more information. But just in case, here's a really quick summary. This is an SVI-328 cartridge that claims to convert the Spectra video into an MSX-compatible computer. It was made by a very small Spanish company back in the 80s, and it looks to have been hand-assembled, so I think very few units were actually created and sold out there. Apart from the cartridge that looks like a heatsink, it comes with a pretty detailed manual in Spanish, going over all the features and how to use it to its fullest potential. The manual, however, doesn't exactly describe how the conversion magic works, but we can deduce quite a bit by how some things are explained and by the fact that we know that the only thing inside the cartridge is a new ROM. We'll get back to that in a bit. The MSX standard was very clearly inspired on the SVI-328. As we saw in a previous video, the main differences are a different cartridge format, a slightly different basic, memory page in size, I.O. port addresses, and a different disk format. So given that, it shouldn't be that big of a leap to turn the SVI-328 into an MSX-compatible machine. Or is it? The first thing this cartridge claims to do is to give the SVI a full MSX basic. That makes sense, since that's just a software change, and the cartridge comes with a full ROM, which, as we saw earlier, it's probably just a modified ROM of the SVI-728 one. So much for intellectual property rights. As part of the basic language upgrade, the SVI-328 got several new commands that were only present on MSX Basic before. They're all pretty advanced commands, but quite useful for having better access to hardware resources. For example, the base command returns the video memory address for some of the system tables. For example, base 6 returns the address of the color table in screen mode 1. Another new command is VDP, which you can already guess it's related to the video chip or VDP. VDP allows you to read or write values to the different ports of the VDP. So with that, you can really take advantage of the different abilities of the graphics without having to dip into assembly. The screen command changes the screen mode. It's already present in regular SVI-328 BASIC, but now it's extended to have a fourth mode, Screen 3, which changes the screen to a middle resolution mode. The BASIC include with the converter also includes a couple enhancements to MSX BASIC, like we'll see in a minute. Also, just in case you want to revert everything to original SVI BASIC mode, you can type CALL SVI and it will reset everything and behave like a regular SVI-328. That's a nice touch, as opposed to having to remove the cartridge and reset the computer. So with all these changes, the user will be able to type up any MSX basic program and it would work on their machine. That might not seem like a big deal today, but don't underestimate the importance of magazine and book type-ins from the time. That's how I played some of my early games and that's how I learned a lot of the programming fundamentals. But apart from typing programs, can the SVI actually load basic programs saved on an MSX computer? Basic programs weren't saved or stored in memory as text strings the way we do today with scripting languages like Python, for example. Instead, as programs are being typed, they're converted into tokens to save memory. So a command like print would actually be converted to a single byte with value 145. That's all a good idea, except that the values for basic tokens on the SVI and MSX are not exactly the same. They're actually similar enough that you wonder why are they different, it looks like it's just a handful of basic keywords like BLOAD and EQV that don't match. Fortunately, since the basic running on the cartridge is the full MSX basic, there's nothing special that needs to be done. It can load MSX basic programs and execute them without any trouble because the token values are exactly what it expects. The manual actually goes into quite a bit of depth about this and even has a whole section on how to do the reverse process, converting a basic program you wrote on the SVI-328 and make it so it can be executed on any MSX computer. That's a very thoughtful thing to include in the manual since it's not exactly related to the conversion itself, but it's something that a lot of users would have probably wanted to do. But obviously, what most people bought this cartridge for back in the 80s was to run MSX games on an SVI-328. So let's see if that works as advertised. Obviously, this won't work for games on cartridge because it uses the cartridge slot. And besides, the MSX cartridge format is different. 
but it does work with games on tape and even claims that it would later work with disk in a future update, but I have a feeling that that update never actually happened. Normally, on the SVI328, you load a binary program with bload cas colon. And if you want to execute it right after loading, you would add a comma r for run afterwards. The conversion ROM extends the bload command to patch the program as it's loaded. Remember that one of the main differences between the SVI328 and the MSX standard is that they use different ports to access hardware resources. So the bload commands seems to search the memory for those ports and patch them to match the ports of the SVI328. There's more to it than that, but let's try this first. I'm going to try loading an MSX program directly on the SVI328 without the conversion cartridge. For that, I'm going to use the excellent SVI CAS. And I'm just going to use bload directly. Interestingly, it doesn't even detect the file I'm trying to load. I wasn't expecting that because I thought the format was the same, so that's a little weird. Maybe there's some kind of magic number in the header or something like that that makes it ignore that file. Okay, now let's put the conversion cartridge and try the same way. The command is still the same, but this is using the new ROM and doing the patching after the load. And yeah, it's detecting the file correctly this time. And it loaded perfectly. So that's great. It worked flawlessly the way they intended to. Unfortunately, not every game is this straightforward. The manual itself includes a table, a large table, with a bunch of MSX games and listing whether they're compatible and, most importantly, if you need to do something different for them to work. As we can see there, Gunfried is listed as working perfectly out of the box. That's the case for quite a few of them, but a lot of them need some extra work. Let's try another one of my favorite games, Sorcery. This one is also listed as working without any changes. And yes, it starts loading just fine. Cool. It has the loading screen and everything. Oh, but now it finished loading and it's frozen. So something didn't work quite right. I can only speculate about why it failed. Maybe this version I tried to load is slightly different from the one that they tested, and this one would need some extra fixes, but I'm not really sure. Let's try a game that requires some extra work. For example, Manic Miner. Apparently, before loading it, you need to do a poke command. I don't know exactly what this does, but I suspect it's overriding a value that the ROM uses during the load patching process. And yes, having done that, it runs perfectly. And here's a more complicated one. To run Hunchback, you need to write a mini program setting several values in memory. I suppose that's the kind of thing you could write once and then save somewhere to load before the game, but it's still quite a bit of work. At least, it worked perfectly and the game works great. One interesting thing mentioned in the manual is that if the game loads and runs correctly, but it's too slow, you could try doing print pad zero after loading it, but before executing it. That makes me wonder if the patching is not just a one-time thing after loading, but maybe it's checking for tables in RAM to change or something like that, which could cause the execution of the game to miss a vertical sync and go really slow. If that's the case, the pad zero command probably disables that and just does the patching once after load. I haven't confirmed any of that by disassembling the ROM, so that's just a theory. Okay, so that table is fine, and it's certainly super useful to have the exact steps I need to follow to load some of the games. But there are many more MSX games than the ones listed there. What if I grab some random ones? Let's try one that I'm familiar with, at least in some other platforms. Bruce Lee is a fantastic platformer that has been ported to just about every 8-bit computer out there. I'm going to try loading it straight up without doing anything special. And cool, it starts loading fine. And yeah, it looks like it works perfectly. I have fond memories of beating that one in the Amstrad CPC. Such a great game. Okay, let's grab another one. Boulder Dash was another game that I really enjoyed, although I never came close to beating that one. And it looks like that one worked great as well. So that's great news. I know it's just a very small sample, but it's really encouraging that I grabbed two games at random that were not in the list and they worked without a problem. I wonder if games released later in the MSX Live were more conscious about using RAM tables for accessing different ports, and that makes them automatically more compatible with this VI328. And now, something I've been waiting for for a long time. 
In past videos, you've seen me order PCBs and components to build different projects, but they were always projects that other people had made. Even though I have a fair amount of experience with electronics and digital design, I had never actually designed my own PCB until now. I decided that making a replica of this board would be a fantastic first project. Not only is it something useful that isn't easily available out there, but it's also really, really simple. This will be my equivalent of Hello World with PCB design. I decided to learn and use KiCad for my PCB design because it's free and it seems very well supported in the community. I think it has all the features I need for the kind of circuits I'll be designing. Besides, I had already used it in the past with pre-made designs just to load them, examine them, and create the Gerber files to send them to be made. I looked online for good resources to learn KiCad and for me, by far, the best resource was a set of videos by John Spacement, I put a link in the description. They were great for me because he's clearly a very experienced board designer and he quickly goes through the whole sequence of creating a board, talking about the gotchas along the way and why you do things a certain way. Highly recommended. I'm obviously not going to repeat what I learned here, so just go watch his videos instead, but we'll go over some of the interesting parts. Before we can design a PCB, we need to know exactly what kind of circuit we need to implement and that's the flow that KiCad also expects. You first need to add the elements and connections to your circuit before you can even think about laying out the board and creating it. I could have copied the original design straight up, but using two small 16 kilobyte EEPROMs is a bit cumbersome, so I decided to use a single 32 kilobyte one instead. It was just a matter of using an end gate with the enable signals for the two EEPROMs and tying the output to an address bit on the new EEPROM. Nothing particularly exciting there. The interesting part comes after you have your circuit created. The next step is to start making the board. When you first start to work on that, the different elements are in a complete jumble, so you'll have to start moving them around in a way that minimizes track crossovers and weird features. I think iCAD has a mode to automatically do track layout, but I constantly read recommendations to avoid it. In any case, it has some smart features like letting you push tracks that are in your way without having to recreate them, which is pretty useful. Another thing I had to solve was the edge connector. In the logical schematic, that's just listed as a pin connector, but when you go into the layout, you also need to decide on the footprint of each element. So for example, the 74LS08 end gate could have been an SMD component or a through-hole one. For standard components, the KiCad libraries will usually have all the different footprints, but they didn't have anything for edge connectors. So I ended up downloading some available libraries for that shape and connecting them to that component. I had to make sure that they had the exact spacing, but it was all pretty straightforward. Incidentally, Earlier, when I was mapping the connections and looking at the cartridge connector, I was puzzled why the signals were arranged that way. They looked like a total jumble when they could have been neatly laid out with all the address bits together, the data bits, the enable signals. But now, finally, when I'm doing the layout for the different tracks, it dawned on me. This weird order is actually the simplest possible layout you get if you put an EEPROM on its side and want to avoid lots of crossovers. I knew there had to be a logical explanation for that, so it feels very satisfying to finally figure it out. Apart from the layout, you also need to decide on the board size and shape. So you go to another layer and literally draw the shape of the board that you want. I wanted mine to fit inside a 3D printed case, so I had to take some very precise measurements, including adding cutouts for the screws of the case. I also spent an extra couple of minutes to give all the corners a slight rounding so they wouldn't be too sharp. Incidentally, the cartridge case for the SVI-328 is identical to the Atari 2600, so I was able to reuse an Atari case design for this. Once I entangled the connections, set the right shape for the board, and created the right footprint, I also added some silk screen markings, labeling the chips and explaining what the board is and where it came from. I posted some early screenshots on the hardware design section of Noel's Retrolab Discord channel, and I got some very useful feedback. For example, some of my tracks had the corners that were a bit too sharp, and my power and ground rails weren't wide enough. Technically, they would have worked fine in this application, but it seems a good habit to get into for future boards. After some tweaks, I had the final design. And who are you going to call when you need to make a PCB? PCB way, of course. <laughs> they also happen to be the sponsors of today's video, but independently of that, I've been really happy with the quality of their boards, their prices, and their turnaround time. Trust me, if I didn't like them, I wouldn't be using them for this. So I exported the Gerber files from KiCad directly and uploaded them to PCBWay website. I was also pretty impressed with their customer support. Every board design you upload goes through a quick review process. It involves a human on the other end doing some sanity checks, and if there are any problems, they get back to you. 
Normally, I never had anything come up, but since this was my own design, of course, there were a few things. It turns out I hadn't specified the edge connector fully, so they asked me about beveling the edge, which is the best way to handle those connectors. I also had solder mask all the way into the connector, which is not normal, and it would probably get all scratched and ugly soon. Most edge connector cars don't have that, and they caught it right away and recommended that I change it. Both of those were really good suggestions that surely saved me an extra iteration. So I submitted the latest version, and then it was a matter of waiting just a few days. In the meanwhile, I also uploaded the design to GitHub. So if you're interested in making your own version or using it as a starting point for something more complex, you're welcome to download it. The link, as usual, is in the description. And here they are. Nice. This looks great. Oh, although I just noticed something there, something that I didn't quite intend. I wonder how many other things are going to be like that. I got little labels there for jumper one, jumper two. I didn't want any labels there to start with because that's not really a set of jumpers. It's just I made a reused, yeah, I guess it was a, a jumper footprint. Um, I think I had that label turned off in KiCad and obviously it made it into the Gerber file. So, whoops. But you know what? If that's the only thing that it's not quite the way I intended it, that would be great. I also noticed PCB Way added that number there. I guess that's part of their manufacturing process. They need some kind of ID number to identify your board. So, yeah, very cool. I'm scared about it. Like, did I measure things correctly? But yeah, that looks that looks like a perfect match with the original one. So that's very encouraging. And the other big test is, will it fit here? So let's just give that a try. I know it's kind of putting the cart before the horse with, you know, trying if it fits in here before to see if it actually, the electronics inside work, but it's, um, it's just part of the excitement of getting your first PCB manufactured that way. So did I do this correctly? And this is the front. I'm just gonna go like that. Ooh, that lines up perfectly there. Oh, beautiful. It fits perfectly and it's nice and secure. And let's see if it fits on the actual computer. That's the final test. It fits perfectly. Fantastic. Okay, let's assemble it and test it then. And these are all the components that go in the cartridge. I'm actually going to use sockets and I'm not convinced that it's going to fit in one of these cases, but uh, this is just good for testing. And if it doesn't fit, we'll make another cartridge. Since I got like 10 different PCBs, we'll make another one that is just soldered in directly. And that is it. It took two minutes to solder. Let's give it a good scrub as usual to get rid of all that flux. There we go. Perfect. And now it's time to program the EEPROM. I'll use my usual EEPROM programmer with two combined 16 kilobyte ROM images in a single file. Okay, time to put it together. And now it's the moment of truth. I need to make sure I put it the right way around. I'm glad I made that note directly on the board saying which way it's supposed to be facing. And yes, it starts up with the correct message. I won't test everything again since this is just a custom ROM and we already have the right startup message, so it's probably working fine. I'm really glad and relieved that my first PCB worked at the first try. Yay! And now let's see if we can fit it in the 3D printed case with sockets and all. It looks like it's a tight fit, but I think it's going to work. Again, it's important to put it facing the correct way, and it looks like I designed it correctly so the chips stick out of the side of the cartridge that has more room. Awesome! 
That's perfect. One final test with everything assembled. It's much easier to insert it in the cartridge slot now, too. The case isn't just for show. It really helps guide it into the slot. As a matter of fact, it's a lot more comfortable to insert this one than the original one. And yeah, it works great. Mission successful. I'm thrilled that the board worked correctly. I know it's not much, but it's a solid beginning. And most importantly, I had a lot of fun with it. It forced me to learn the basics of circuit design and PCB layout, and now I feel that I can start tackling more complex designs that I've had in my head for quite a while. As a matter of fact, I'd love to take this simple design further into a full multi-card system for the SVI-328, store the ROM files on an SD card, select them through a few buttons and a small OLED screen, and the rest should be pretty similar to how it is right now. I also have a bunch of ideas for Amstrad extensions, development boards, and lots of things. So expect to see PCB designs here on a regular basis from now on. And how about you? Are there any particular projects you'd like me to make? If so, let me know in the comments. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.